Um, I'm wondering, uh, the obvious question came up at the end, is, this, is it the canary in the coal mine? Is this, uh, is, is Detroit unique? What are the unique aspects of Detroit versus what uh, we can expect for the rest of America? Well, I'd say that there are certain, I mean, every city has its Oh, so let me first introduce oh. Heidi Ewing and Rachel Grady, the two filmmakers. Thank you. Rachel from Washington, D.C., Heidi from Detroit. That's and we'll right. get into how they ended up uh, doing this movie in, in a little bit. But let's talk a little bit about Detroit and the country first. Well, every city has obviously its own unique um, circumstances, and you don't want to lump every city into the same boat. Although Detroit, I think um, certain things that make it um, especially difficult to fix is, well, food things. I mean, it's a city that never recovered from the riots. So people talk about the riots, I was telling you earlier, as if they happened yesterday. Um, the flight out of the city in 1967 is almost unimaginable. Um, my parents were part of that flight, so I grew up five miles from the city instead of in the city. And that city suburb divide is very, very strong and um, really has never been uh, healed in so many ways. So um, I think that's something that lies beneath the surface of a lot of the problems of Detroit. That's one thing. Another thing is it's, it really was that one industry town. It's never, it was not a place that promoted entrepreneurship. Um, it's really that, that patriarchal relationship with the, with the corporation. So um, I think that's ingrained in the people and it's hard to get out of And Now there, there are sprouts and entrepreneurs coming in and, and there, there are things sort of changing in the city, but it's taken a long, long time for any, any of these small businesses to really take hold in this city. I think that's one other problem. And also the physical geography of Detroit is, is very, uh, it's unwieldy, 140 square miles. Um, the city is um, bisected by several highways. It's hard to get from one place to the next. Or if you do, like for example, when you come from the suburbs to the city, if you want to go to the casino or Greek town or some of the uh, the Opera House, for example, you can go on, one, uh, on a highway, never really see the city, park underground, go see the performance, get in your car and leave. So there's really such a division, even geographically, um, it's, th th that's a big problem for the city and even getting around. So I think that has, has created many, many islands in Detroit. So whereas the young hipster kids are living in Corktown, most of the, of the Detroiters uh, and the rest of the city have no, they don't feel the impact at all of these newcomers. Um, and so I think that um, that's another unique problem to Detroit, it's sheer size. It's not Pittsburgh or Cleveland that, that was able in some way to, has been able, I think, to do better than Detroit so far. So, so you contrasted the decay, the loss of manufacturing, the um, difficult uh, ability of people to cope with all that, um, with the arts, with the opera, the new artists coming in. Rachel, what, what's your uh, take on um, the role of arts in this, uh, in this story? It's extremely important. It's what makes a city a city. It's what sets cities apart from other parts of the country, uh, culture and art. Um, and I think that the new people coming in are extremely important. It happens in you know, um, challenged cities all over the country, but we also think, and I think that it reflects in the film, that they can't fix it. They need to partner with, you know, generations of people that have been there, and there needs to be a collaboration, which in Detroit hasn't happened yet. So let's talk about that collaboration, that uh, ability to cope with the problem. I mean, a number of people said, well, this is the way it used to be, mm -hmm. or we're not going to accept that. Right. Um, we're not going to, you know, deal with it. Is that a? Uh, can we attribute that to um, the the tradition of that manufacturing city, or is it the leadership, or is it, uh, you know, is there something that distinguishes Detroit in this respect? Well, as an outsider, so, yeah, it seemed, the outsider than the it region. seemed extremely nostalgic. It's mm -hmm. a nostalgic place. It's, mm -hmm. I think it's nostalgic, not just for the people that live there, but also for people that don't live there. Mm -hmm. It's this, you know, epic city that, you know, industries from American might. It was the engine of um, the war machine. It's where 
the white middle class started, it's where the black middle class started, it's, it's, it's storied, it's epic. So it's hard to let that go away. You don't want that to go away. Those are things that we're proud of and that made America incredible. So I think it lives with a lot of ghosts. And Heidi, your, your take on the leadership? I don't totally of... disagree with that at all. I mean, I think nostalgia is, is ever present in Detroit. And you talk to 24 year olds and they, act, they talk about Detroit uh, in a way, you know, in, in the past tense, in a way as if they lived that. They, they talk about an era they never lived in, but with nostalgia, it's very interesting. So I think it is heavy with nostalgia. I think the, the city means a lot to the country as a whole, and they know that. Um, but I also think the solutions that have been posed the, to Detroiters are not palatable to them. So they don't, they don't really, change is difficult already. And they, I mean, moving their homes, um, shrinking the city, changing neighborhoods, these are not solutions that people like, you know, I mean, uh, it's, it's hard to accept these, these sorts of radical ideas. Also, if you think about it, I mean, the Great Migration, which brought, you know, millions of African Americans from the South to the North, to the industrial, um, you know, epicenter of the country, uh, their great grandparents, you know, uh, were farmers and worked in agriculture. So a lot of people we talked to in Detroit, the idea of considering urban farming, as you saw a little bit in the film, really is hard to take. I mean, it's a funny scene in the movie, but the idea that that's not why my people came here to become farmers again. So no, we came here to build things. And that runs really, really deep. Um, and also I think there's the fear of a lot of people that have lost their jobs that um, if manufacturing doesn't come back to Detroit, what are they going to do? They're not prepared or educated to do anything else, um, especially sort of the unskilled laborers that had made a middle class wage up until now. So these are a very, it's a very, very scary time for the country and also especially for Detroit. And they don't like any of the solutions that have come down their way, even though I don't really know how the city is going get to get around really shrinking itself. I think. Um, they don't call it shrinking anymore. They call it, they don't even call it downsizing. The, the mayor calls it right sizing. And Mayor Bing is a, a leader that is um, not corrupt. I mean, the last mayor, Kwame Kilpatrick, ended up in jail and had all kinds of scandals. And so it, Mayor Bing is doing the best that he can. I think it's, um, he, came, he came into a huge budget crisis. They can't pay their bills. They laid off 169 police, firefighters 24 hours ago. Um, the state had to come in and, and sort of give them a bailout. The street lights have started to go out in many neighborhoods. So these are realities. They can't pay. The, the city can't function. It's not a functional place right now. But, you know, other cities have, you know, Pittsburgh was dominated by the steel industry, and they came mm -hmm. together, and they've, you know, they uh, have medical, they have uh, computer. They, you know, there are other cities who have dealt with this issue. It seems like Detroit has not diversified. gone to the, they didn't diversify, they didn't go to the service economy, they didn't go to some other economies. Not yet, but it could. And there's been a lot of, there are, there are a lot of ideas being floated to solutions for Detroit, but nothing is fully, fully taken, taken root. I mean, I think a partnership with the universities is a good idea. You've got the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, which is only like an hour and 15 minutes away. You've got Wayne State University downtown. I think, you know, and the, the, the mayor just announced a, um, a deal with Wayne State University two days ago, which is gonna really explore the urban farming thing with financing. So I think they are gonna sort of take advantage of some of these educational partnerships. And that's really, really crucial, I think, for the city. So I'm gonna ask you another question about Detroit, and then I wanna ask a little bit about your filmmaking. Um, is there a bright side that you saw there that you, I mean, it's pretty, uh, pretty gl uh, grim. Uh, what's, you have a bright side that you see coming out of there? Well, while we were editing the film, actually, um, a couple of things did happen. I mean, the um, Dan Gilbert, who's um, the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers and also is a, a owns Quicken Loans, has been, you know, subsidizing his employees. If they'll move to Detroit, they get a subsidy and encouraging his employees to come down. A few other companies did that at Wayne State and uh, DTE and Blue Cross. So they're trying to incentivize their employees to come live in the city. But they're not doing it. I mean, a few hundred have come. Um, some have come. But these are little small drops, but that is something, you know, that people are attempting to do. Um, is, and there a, is there a white core on the outside or a, is it a... You know, I, it, you mentioned that uh, young kids were moving back into the city. Is there a? They uh, live. They live in a neighborhood called. Most of them live in a, cor a neighborhood called Corktown, um, which is not too far from downtown Detroit. Um, and you know, a I lot think, of stuff is bringing up there. Yeah. yeah, and that is where you see the new businesses: a little coffee shop here, a little hostel there. So tell us how you 
got the inspiration for the movie and how long ago, and, uh, how you started out? Well, Heidi's from there, so she saw it all go down and her family's in manufacturing and was very much a part of her life. And I am a lifelong city liver and um, visited Detroit a couple times on my own and was blown away. I don't know if anyone's been there recently, but it's pretty startling. It's, it's, a, it's a big deal. It's, you know, as, a, as an American, it's a big deal to see empty skyscrapers, yeah. abandoned skyscrapers. And I just was wondering, what happened to this place? How did, how did this happen? How, how, you know, this is, we live in America. How did this happen? And Heidi and I just were talking about it, and it seemed like a very rich thing to explore. And are there filmmakers that inspired you in, in, as you looked at uh, taking this approach to Detropia? Well, there is the, the, the tradition of the city symphony, you know, like, you know, Berlin Symphony of the City. There's, um, you know, even sort of the films of Robert Altman that kind of skip around from one place to the next, from one story to the next. You know, these are the, the sort of inspirations that we took because, you know, there's, there's clearly not, you know, we're not following one character. It's different from other films. There's not a specific narrative arc. If you're, you're trying to, the city's a character in and of itself, and that's really, really hard to pull off. So we decided we really had to have a chorus of people. And once we were, we were okay with that, it freed us up to really explore. And when we would run across those scrappers in the middle of the, you know, at late afternoon on a winter day, we, we would stay and we would shoot it. And we, we knew there was a place for it in the film because it was one voice of the film. And so we were, I, you know, it was, it was a completely different approach than we've taken in the past. But if you're gonna you know, take on a city, you really have to be open to all the different voices and try to include as many as you can. So uh, I'm gonna ask them another question, but as I do, uh, people should be preparing to ask questions. We have somebody, somebody with mic. There's a question down here. So my uh, last question: What were your barriers in trying to get this uh, this movie done? And how, how long was it? A couple of years. A couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd say, well, a couple of barriers were, as Heidi was saying, that it's hard to wrap your mind around telling the story of a city, especially that's as epic of the yeah, city yeah. and has had its up and downs and how do you tell that in 90 minutes or whatever, that's challenging. And also, um, Detroiters are tough, you know, and a lot of people have tried to explore what's happened there and um, they're, they're not that into it, <laughs> you know, so um, also, the ministry that really the, the we had definitely had a hard time getting access to the mayor and the mayor's office. I mean, they that definitely um, they're not a very very they had not, they were not a very open and transparent administration when we were there because they just wanted to keep a really tight ship, and so they're not very media friendly. It's changed a little bit over the last six months for sure, but it took us a long time to get the mayor and his office and his people to allow us to even film what we did with him. That was definitely a, a challenge. Let's go to the first question. And, and actually, if you could identify yourself, that'd be great. Okay, I, oh, there we go, okay. My name is Jenny James, and I was interested in whether or not any of the movie was scripted, or was it all spontaneous that you captured? No, no scripting, it was all spontaneous. Well, I think it was very successful in capturing a variety of voices, and certainly that part of it was very enjoyable. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, we'll go here, and then Janet. Um, I thought this movie was, you know, overwhelming because I've never lived in a place um, quite like that. And I'm wondering, would you think of using this movie as a medium to recruit companies to capture this energy of these people that are clearly willing to work? That's a great idea. It's a uh, great question. Yeah. And let me let me throw another question on top of it, which is what 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 is your aim in a movie like this? When you create sure. that movie, what, what do you expect to have come out of it? Right. Well, I mean, you have big hopes for your movies, you know? We always have big hopes, and we have a lot of things that we want to spur and happen. Um, and there's only so much a film can do, but um, one thing, 
a couple things is would be um, the concept and the embracement of community for everybody, not just in cities, but especially in cities. And I think it's something that's incredibly important and that we're drifting away from and that can help people that live in communities like Detroit. And also, I mean, just on a practical level, maybe holding on to the manufacturing that we have left. I mean, just on a practical level. Um, and <clears throat> trying to attract a little bit more. I mean, it's, it's our foothold. It's the middle class's foothold. Okay, and... and but that didn't answer your question. Um, but I think we would love to show to, to businesses who are interested in coming to Detroit and um, show that there's a lot of spirit and pluck to the people and, like you say, a willingness to work. And there's a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of empty, vacant properties and land. And it just takes some innovation and some, some visionaries to come in. And, and a lot could happen in a place like Detroit. It really it is not an empty canvas or a blank slate because there's a whole history there, nor should it be. But there is opportunity in, in Detroit. And also in terms of message, I mean, you know, we hear about the shrinking of the middle class. And we hear about you know, that hollowing out. And we hear about um, you know, the offshoring. And, but this is really a look at on the ground, what does that look like to regular people who are living it? Um, and you know, the consequences are dire. And so, I, I you know, it, it, manufacturing sector has been become front and center. I think again in the American mindset, but only in the last year really have you been seeing it covered in the national news. So I, I'm glad that there, there's being attention paid to that because we don't have to. It doesn't all have to go away. There are things we can do, and there are advantages we do have. So that that would be one of my aims as well to get that conversation to help contribute to that conversation. Janet. Yeah. Um, oh, so, say say who you are. Yeah, I'm Janet Topolsky, and Charlie knows me because I work with him at the Aspen Institute, <laughs> and uh, and everyone who works at the Aspen Institute knows that I'm from Detroit. So this is this is a very emotional film for me. Um, but I, but it's interesting to hear your answer to the last question, because I was struck, and I'd be curious to know most of your filming is in a core part of Detroit, and as you said, it's 140. Two miles. Uh, I mean, I've I go back all the time. I'm going to be in Detroit all next week, and you know, I go around, and there are parts of Detroit that have stayed somewhat. Um, I don't want to say vibrant, but working, mm -hmm. and none of that is in the movie. Uh, I'm not saying that as a criticism, because as I said, your last thing, you're you're trying to send a message with the movie, mm -hmm. and it doesn't focus on any of the pieces that are working. I'm not even talking about the new. Uh, the, uh, the people who are coming to it newly, I'm talking about the people who have never left, who have maintained some working neighborhoods and mm -hmm. who have stayed committed. So, I mean, was that a choice or did you try to stay geographically within one place? Well, actually, um, you know, the, some of the, obviously the Opera House is, is downtown Detroit. Sure. And Cafe 1515, where Crystal works, is across the street from the Opera House. So that would be downtown, obviously. Mr. Stevens, the Raven Lounge is on the east side and border yeah. of Hamtramck. Um, we have uh, several shots that are actually on, over on the far west side. Um, we shot in southwest. I mean, you know, there, we didn't, I mean, the characters we actually found, I mean, we, we settled on people that we really had thought we had, we went with the people first, right? So right. Um, we really thought the union story was important. So and George McGregor was at Local 22, which is on Michigan Avenue. Right. Um, so but we really liked his message. With Mr. Tommy Stevens, um, the fact that he's a business owner, a black business owner, that is holding down the fort on a, on a pretty, pretty much empty block, we found that an inspirational and different way to look at an entrepreneur in Detroit. So you know, he was on Shane Street, and we loved his bar, and we loved his spirit and his intelligence. And he also, that exterior is in Palmer Woods, where he lives, where he's in his house. Right. Um, and uh, you know he's and you, you a, could he's see a middle a class. Bit of this very business. nice house at night. You could see just a little bit of it through the dark. Yeah, the that, that's where you know. Right. Um, and um, okay. so, and then the other. That, so those are our three main characters. We really chose them really because of who they were and right. the message that they had, and they lived in those areas. Um, so, it, no, I wasn't like a conscious. I'm trying to answer your question. Um, yes, we want to bring attention to um, the city. I mean, there's been you know. Since the Super Bowl commercial, there's been and many, many style section 
uh, entries in the New York Times there, about the, the new young crowd coming in. There's been this, like, Detroit's back and it's all going to be okay. And there's been this uptick in manufacturing, these huge corporate profits which have not trickled down in a large way to employment. So I guess we didn't want to let everybody off the hook and be like, it's totally okay there. These kids have shown right. up. It, it, so, so I guess, yeah, it, it, we, did, we did want to provoke a reaction. But it's not like we avoided specific okay. areas. I we appreciate just sort that. Of, I just wanted, you know. Let's move on to another, another question. Yeah, um, my name's Mike Lane, and it's very interesting because tomorrow's my birthday, 68 birthday. years old, and I was born and raised in Detroit. Happy birthday. So everything I saw in that, it made me sad, but everything you've said about what has happened there is so true, especially after the riots. It was unbelievable how people fled that city. It was, it was a disaster. Absolutely, um, in 67. I left Detroit because I had to go, I went away to school, mm -hmm. ended up in Philadelphia. But one of the things that I always said about Detroit is somehow they never embraced their history. They never really developed that sense of come to Detroit to see the history of Detroit, the, the, what they did after the Second World War uh, or during the war. And that, that's, when I went to Philadelphia, I saw the, the, the city, it just embraces its history. It's incredible. It's and they developed that downtown of Philadelphia based on that. And it was, it was remarkable. It, 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 it's an interesting point. And at yeah. the same time, we found that people had that nostalgia and that sense of place, and they kept going back to it. This is Detroit. I, I, I yeah. love it. So but the, they haven't developed it for the city, the, mm -hmm. that tourism, mm -hmm. that incredible sense they of They haven't what, capitalized what they can, on it. They haven't capitalized on it. They should yeah. capitalize on it, actually. I think a lot of people would go visit. More people would go visit. Yeah. Let's get Shen Yu. Uh, can we get a, a, one of our visitors from the Freedom, sorry, the, the Friendship Committee of China. And China yeah. was obviously an important foil in the... They're obsessed with China and Detroit. Yeah. All roads okay. led to China and Detroit. I don't know how, but it Thank did. Thank you. And my name is Xin Yu Li. Uh, I'm from, uh, not Freedom, and I'm from Chinese People's Association for Friendship with Foreign Countries. We are, of course, a government organization, basically doing people-to-people -people exchange, you know, uh, uh, how to say, programs. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the invitation by the uh, Aspen... Uh, you know, institute. Well, this uh, documentary, it's documentary, right? Yes. Okay, it's uh, uh, really very emotional. But I have a couple of questions. Number one, and BYD is uh, Chinese like uh, automobile company. And uh, you know, since you use the real name and everything, it seems like advertisement for them. <laughs> yeah, it, really. So Well, we didn't mean to make an advertisement yeah, no, for no, no, them. I mean, whether they know this or not, if they know, I mean, they you should pay happy. you. They would love it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. They should pay us. You're yeah, right. they should pay you. You're right. Really. They I love that them. idea. Yeah, because it's a big advertisement for them. Yeah, I mean, if something, do you think that they have seen this movie or not? No, they, no, I don't think they've seen it yet. Okay, I don't think if you need it. some help, I will contact them and say, yo, really? <laughs> because I think it's definite. I mean, well, this is... The other thing is, um, have you been to China? Not yet. would love to go. This is very interesting. You have never been to China? No, I, no. I've been to China. Oh, you too. Actually, okay. So, okay. Welcome. But I'll and, come with you. I'll go. Oh, with sure. You. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah, <laughs> thank we you. We will be your host. <laughs> and uh, the, the other question, because it, last year we complete. Uh, a documentary about American flying tiger, and also showed in this uh, you know festival mm -hmm. at the beginning, and I just wonder, how is the documentary market in United States? In okay. other words, when you finish this documentary, you want to put into theater yes. or go for the TV? Both. Yeah. yeah. So that's so, a great that's a great question because I wanted to finish. We need to wrap up, and I wanted to finish with the both the financing and the marketing of, mm -hmm. a, of a documentary like this, because, you know, it's not easy. So, no. one of you want to um, address the, both the financing and then the marketing? One, one take one, one take well, the other? Well, the film is going to be um, in the theaters throughout the United States, and um, we are self-distributing. Starting usually, in September. Usually, um, in the past, we've had 
professional distributors doing it, but we've decided to do it ourselves for a lot of reasons. It is also going to be on public television, PBS in the United States. And um, the model that we've followed is that usually television pays for the film. They get the television rights, and then we do other things with the film. But we're lucky. That's a great model. So it was funded by the Ford Foundation, and PBS funded the majority of this film. And then we had other funders were the Sundance Documentary Fund and a few other private foundations. So it was a consortium, but mainly the Ford Foundation and PBS were the biggest funders behind it. The film will open in 25 cities starting September 7th. It will be then in, September, in January, it'll be on VOD and DVD, and then it'll be on public television in May 2013. But let me add one thing, which is you've also put it on Kickstarter. Yes, so we raised our distribution money, yeah. For the first time, we decided to raise distribution funds on Kickstarter, and we raised $70,000 in, in a few weeks. Uh, that'll be help cover our distribution costs. We'd never done that, so crowdfunding was really exciting for this movie. We put the trailer up there and description of the film, and people were moved by it and wanted to see it in their own city. So we're actually bringing the film into places like Madison, Wisconsin, and Cleveland, Ohio, and places that don't necessarily get uh, indie films right away, indie documentaries anyway. So that was part of the reason we want to take it out ourselves, because we want to bring it to places that want to see it, and not just LA, San Francisco, and New York. Um, you know, you, you want to go a little further than that and have a discussion. Places that have more in common with the so trade. that's yeah. one of the reasons that we're doing it on our own, and then we've already booked the film in a lot of those theaters. And you know, we have a Facebook page. Look up Detropia, and all of our screening times and all of the information will be there. So check us out, please. Coming to a screen near you. That's Heidi right. Ewing, thank you very much. Rachel thank Brady, you so much. thank you. Thank you.